Okay, so um, thanks for talking to us today, Barry. Um, for anyone watching this for first time, I am Fergus, so I work for the Malin Skunks team as well. I am the 3D CAD engineer and modeler in the uh, Malin Skunks. This is the third video in a series of uh, recordings that we're doing with uh, industry experts. And today we are talking with Barry uh, from Australia Digital and Progresso. Now I'm taking it you're doing work for for us within the Malin Group. Is it Progresso or Clean Ships? I'm not quite sure how that's. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not quite it. sure either. <laughs> but basically, yeah, we're part <laughs> well, of the so group towards clean sheets, and there's been a rebranding thing. Yeah. But I'm sure, other people are. I up the page pay grade will describe what that's about. So. Yeah. So, Barry, yeah, so it no, would be yeah. really good if. Yeah, if you could, if you could dive in with a little bit. Uh, a, background about yourself i know we had spoken before so it'd be just really good if you could uh, give us a little background about your history with photogrammetry and cartography and a little bit kind of how you fit into uh, doing some work with a uh, clean ships and malin etc and uh, kind of a little bit of background of photogrammetry and how that kind of really fits in that'd be really good Okay, no problem, uh, Fergus. Um, so I've been working, as you probably tell by the grey hair, I've been working for some time. Um, uh, uh, it's This is my 40-something year of working in photogrammetry. I started off with the Ordnance Survey um, using photogrammetry for making maps and then moved into using photogrammetry for industrial dimensional control and alignment. Um, I now work for Astria Digital and Astria uh, are a company who are using photogrammetry to help people share information, whether that's dimensional information or actually uh, to use it as a what we call visual asset management. Think of Google Street View on steroids slash Wikipedia. It allows people to take a tour around their ship, around their fabrication possibly, um, wherever it may be, and then to look at that on the internet. Uh, I think so at Google Street View, but as a portal to information and knowledge management too. Now, photogrammetry allows us to build an environment or what we call reality capture. And it's just one of the tools that's available for us to use. Um, a lot of you will have heard about laser scanning or photogrammetry is more like it's Cinderella sister. It's prettier and better looking. Um, <laughs> okay. and more interesting for me but I but to be fair I'm a dimensional control engineer too so I spent 10 years of my life lining up periscopes and propeller shafts so right. marine industry I know quite a lot about and we've used photogrammetry for lots of different applications alongside other forms of dimensional measurement control um, whether that's in QA, whether that's in shipbuilding, whether that's in, in mechanical alignment, fabrication checking, all sorts of things. And photogrammetry is great because it went out of favour a bit because in the old days, even 20 years ago when I was doing it, I used to have to go out with a film camera and then take enough stuff to produce to turn my cabin or my uh, bathroom in a hotel into a dark room so I could actually develop the photographs on site and just see whether they were good enough. Now the now the advent of digital cameras and mobile phone cameras and all that sort of stuff, we can take thousands of photographs. In the old days, I used to have to use a slide rule and a, all sorts of calculators and stuff to to do the maths involved. Now I press a button and to be honest, anybody can fog up a mirror can actually produce a 3D model. <laughs> it's how accurate it is and what you do with it is the main thing and Astria have sort of like two bits we advise people on photogrammetry and how you can use it but our main thing is actually to recreate sites ships um on spaces. major markets yeah yeah spaces that people can interact with but they don't need to be a cad pilot to do it yeah um, so we so i hate would yeah democratization of visual space some mm -hmm. people call it. Just be fair. We our tagline is "Be there from anywhere." Yeah, it's it's really good. You'd showed me a uh, example of kind of some of your work uh, with that before, and I think uh, seeing Google Street View on steroids is a very good uh, <laughs> analogy for it because that's exactly what it is. Being able to kind of 
go around in any space that you can capture and be able to zoom in to such a high level of detail and be able to inspect parts that if you're across the world and be able to see an exact uh, join on a bridge somewhere that you can go in and expect and have we look around it's it is amazing and that that's one aspect of the photogrammetry where you're kind of creating an environment where you can move around and inspect and look at as well but the, the other aspect of photogrammetry where you're using photographs that have create a physical 3d model as well like yeah. um to create that which can be used for metrology purposes like you've spoken about as well is is that kind of really another side to a coin where you're creating CAD models from it rather than the the 3D space where you're stitching photos together yeah I mean to be fair we use the basic same processes and and then this sort of diverts into two rows there's, there's those people who want to use it to visualize an experience and attach documents to it like an instruction manual or a well certificate for documentation what we call site or visual documentation but there's the other part of it which is used for dimensional control we produce a model anyway um, and we've got all the data. If we're just using it for what we call 360 or smart 360s, which is what Google is, mm -hmm. or we're like Google, but another level of performance, accuracy, resolution, and flexibility. Um, the same data can be used for extracting a 3D model and then using that to do inspection or verification or all sorts of cool things that you know any fabrication process could use. Yeah. For example, it may well be that you want to design a fabrication to mate up with something else. OK, now, unless you've got accurate information to know, like the diameter of that flange or how flat it is or what angle it's lying at, um, you're always in the possibility of it not working when you try and join them up on site. Yeah, of course. And um, um, we'll talk about one of the big examples of that, but maybe now but one of the jobs I worked on was the International Space Station in the dim and distant past. And there I was fortunate enough to have the job of going around and making sure all of the elements around the world that were made in Russia and Germany and Kansas City and all places actually would join. Yeah, of course. Um, now, the tolerance wasn't as bad as you'd think or as, as close as you would think because it has because they're compensated for the fact that in space you can't align things to a thousandth of an inch. You've got mm -hmm. motors and jets and things. So there was a capture, but the surfaces had to be flat and the bolt positions had to be right. That's the ultimate in alignment and making sure that the fabrications join together. Yeah. But equally, it can apply if I'm fabricating something at one end of the shed and try and join it at the other end of the shed. We all yeah. know that it's really easy to drop a clanger and not those things. And then that costs rework, it costs all sorts of things. And particularly if it's delivered to site, it costs all sorts, all sorts of embarrassment when you get on site. Yeah, and, and, and it's not right when you get there. If it's not right, and that is the that is one of the issues that um, most fabrication people have. I spent 20 years doing 3D models for the oil industry to make sure spool pieces, compressor trains would fit into the oil platform that we use photogrammetry for yeah. not laser scanning laser yeah. scanning is great but it's not got the accuracy you need for some fabrications that, that's what i was going to ask next so some people watching this might have heard of laser scanning and just automatically think yes yeah, that's much more accurate uh, rather than just taking a regular old photograph can you really could you maybe tell us a little bit about the difference of like the basics of how laser scanning maybe works compared to photogrammetry and really what the differences are with it. Okay. I think you gave me a good explanation last time about laser scanning coming from a single point and it was very interesting. Okay, laser scanning is done from a, a from an instrument which basically sends out a pulse of light and measures the time it takes to come back and it does it does these as millions of points around a 360 degree. And um, as you get further away, the points get further away. Yeah. Now, a lot of the accuracy is based on the reflectivity of the surface, what angle it's bouncing off at. Right. And things. But generally speaking, typical accuracy I'd be expecting to get for, uh, say you were scanning a ship, I'd be expecting to get an accuracy of something around about 20 to 30 millimeters between one end and another. Now, that sounds like it's pretty small. Um, Oh, not very much. But if you're doing a spool piece and that's the last piece and the, you've got the wrong measurement, that's annoying. Yeah. Okay. 
So photogrammetry, you can actually, so that produces a point cloud from which you can extract and produce a solid 3D model. Yeah. So you would put this into, you would extract the shapes like cylinders or flat surfaces and then produce a 3D model and then you'd use your design. The other thing that you would use point clouds for is if you've got a CAD model and then you use it for a thing called clash detection. If I'm designing something, I want to see if I'm putting this pipe work through another set of pipes. Mm. So point clouds are often just used to sanity check a design by making sure things are not going through bits that they shouldn't go through. Right. Because when you get on site, that's the last thing you want. If you've designed a whole area of stuff and there's bits going to, it's going to compromise other bits which you might not know about, then that causes more trouble on site and it's just painful. So you use it to point clouds to use a LIDAR point, two things, 3D models and for cloud and for clash detection. Photogrammetry can do both of those, but it's really limited in its accuracy. Whereas a LIDAR cloud, I can go to 50 meters and it'll be plus or minus 20 mil. Um, photogrammetry, it sort of falls off. It's really accurate locally to 10 meters. And then you can get down and down and down and down to a level of accuracy. So, for example, on uh, International Space Station and for some, say, I used to use it for crane slewing bearings to measure the flatness. Mm -hmm. um, in those, we can get down to thousands of an inch, so 0.025 of a millimeter. Um, so it's much more accurate locally. So typically, if I was doing a re-engineering project, I'd probably use um, uh, point clouds to give me a general view, full of clash detection, things like that. Um, but then if I was looking at doing something like a flange face or I'm fitting to the last bit, the spool piece that I need to fit in, then I'd probably use photogrammetry because I can get more accuracy from that. Yeah. OK. And you can just do it. You don't need anything special. You just need yeah. to know what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of knowledge that goes into being able to do it easily. Uh, it's because since, since our last ch chat, uh, this kind of brings me on to my next point as well. Since our last chat as well, there is quite a lot of um, softwares out there, and you had mentioned quite a few. And I've done a little bit of going into it, and there's the level of photogrammetry, which is hobbyist, which you can do at home with your phone and some free software where you can go around and take a couple of hundred pictures of an object and you can stitch them together and make a model but even even with trying to do that and taking some time to do it it's nigh near impossible to make something that is would be usable in a in a industrial sense um it's it, it's it does seem a bit like a black art being able to know exactly what type of photos the quality of photos the lighting and everything that kind of goes along with that so my my, my name my main next question kind of was the levels of of accessibility so you can come into it as a hobbyist level to maybe make a little model that you could use in a 3d scene but then moving up to metronomy and being able to accurately measure items and things is that quite a, a big leap in between now that we have all these new softwares that do a lot of the calculations and stuff for us or is it quite a is it still an area that is a lot of knowledge is needed to be able to take the correct photos and set up the 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 data correctly so that you're getting the correct results it's a good question um over the last few years we've seen a massive massive change in um the ability to capture photographs. The main limitation in getting accurate photogrammetric models is not to do with the camera, it's more to do with the images that you get out of it. So at Astria, we've, we have a product called RichPix in our platform, and RichPix is a process for improving the quality of the imagery so we can remove um, the areas of shadows and area of highlights that are overexposed and underexposed where we don't get any data. Yeah. Now, if I'm taking a normal photograph, um, it might be, say I was just taking a flash photograph inside, then I bounce the flash and it just overexposes certain, especially with white painted yeah. fabrication. Yeah. It's got no data in it. So what RichPix does is that we use a technique called 32 bit photogrammetry, which we sort of invented, really, but that's another story. But basically, what we do is we get rid of all the shadows and the highlights, and then we've got a consistent image that we can use to produce. Mm -hmm. high quality metrology spec imagery yeah 
Now, the interesting thing is what's happening in, is now it used to be like uh, you needed special cameras, um, you need this, but and then, you know, with these things now, the iPhone 12, for example, I'm just doing some comparisons with the new LiDAR system that's in them. That opens up a whole new world of what you can do, but it is about the accuracy you can you can get. So hobbyists stuff. Uh, yeah, there's lots of programs you can do. Get an app on your iPhone, use a lovely 3D model of your pot or your vase, show your granny or something or sell on eBay. Yeah, that's one of the things exactly. people do. But if I'm doing fabrications and things, the major thing I need to is photogrammetry is a fantastic tool. But the main thing is the camera doesn't know how far away it is from the object. So you have to put things in there that you can scale. Yeah. So if you're a fisherman and you want to show how big your fish is that you've caught, you put a real one in it. OK, yeah. it's exactly the same thing with point, trilogy. Yeah. What we have to have is traceability. So if we photographed an artifact of a known length, a calibrated length, with targets at either end, we've got a scaled ruler which is traceable for metrology purposes. What we can then do is say, ah, well, if this measures this in this, then that seam or that piece of fabrication, that flange should be the same. So we have to have some level of traceability, and that's the big difference. Yeah. You can take lots of photographs, but it's all about the scale, and you need to have some sort of artifact in the image or within the series of images that you can refer to. Okay, so does so, that need to be in every image? No. That, the artifact, no. No, it doesn't. It just has to be in uh, photogrammetry, photogrammetry software. It's really cool. What it does is it uses, I don't want to get too complicated, but basically what it does is it looks for patterns. Photogrammetry works in the same way as in the old days. You know, you used to have those stereoscope viewers, the click yeah. with the cardboard circle, and you, like to put it up and you get 3D. Yeah. Same thing. So you need an overlap of imagery. And to know where it's overlapped is what it does is it goes in and looks at a pixel on one part of the image and then does a, like a digital fingerprint of the pixels around it. So that becomes like a virtual target. Think of it okay. as a fingerprint. OK, and then it goes and looks at the other photograph for the same pattern and it goes, well, if I can see that one there and that one there, they must be aligned. Right. That's how it works. And then it goes back and works out the camera position and X, Y and Z and lots of other complicated coordinate transformation things, which I don't want to bore you with because yeah. you'd all lose, you'd all <laughs> fall asleep. The simple thing is now you press a button and the software does it for you. Yeah. So if you are trained to take the photographs in the right way, and if you do it in the right procedure, I think I could train anybody up in a day to be able to get metrology quali quality imagery, mm -hmm. possibly less than that. You need to be a photographer to make sure the image, or you understand photography to make sure the images are the best quality. So things are in focus. If it's not yeah, in focus, not blurry, you yeah. it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Um, but it's not hard to do. Um, do and it goes down to you can, if, you, if you're shown, you use the right camera. And these are conventional digital SLRs. And, and they're nothing special in terms of these are things you would use for landscape photography or portrait photography, maybe at the higher end. So a couple of grand, it's worth a kit, can do it. Mm -hmm. You can go to, so the cameras that we use are 24 megapixels, but you can go to 100 megapixel and spend 30 grand if you want to get down to stuff and the stuff we do in the nuclear industry for example is looking at micro cracks well there we would be looking at a 100 megapixel image because a pixel is much smaller covers a much smaller area of ground or surface that's the other big thing we need to talk about ground surface coverage but no anyone can be trained to do it it's not hard and that's one of the benefits of that over laser scanning because laser yeah. scanning you need to be good at two things. One, the scanning, and two, registering all the different point clouds so they produce one big one. Big yeah, model. nothing together. That can be a problem. The beauty of, one of the advantages of photogrammetry over laser scanning is that pretty well anyone can do it. And, you know, whether it's a fabrication where you work into five, 10 millimeters tolerance, yeah, that'll work. But then you may want to go to smaller, more accurate, more localized accuracies, like a face of a flange, or you're trying to figure out a diameter of a bore or something. Yeah. Then you can go down and use photography to do that. But you have to have an artifact in there so you can calibrate it. Yeah. But that's just a mm -hmm. simple, we use, um, uh, there's lots of ways of doing it, but you could put a calibrated slip gauge in there, or a, no, not slip gauge, but, you know, calibrated bar. Yeah. 
-hmm. So we have calibrated bars that go up to two meters and right. you know, and they're traceable. So they've got a calibration certificate against it, and it right, and okay. up, which allows traceability. Okay, amazing. That's good. So, uh, my my next point that I had um, to ask you was where you see photogrammetry kind of going in five to ten years' time. But also along with that, I kind of wanted to ask, uh, along with the area, I don't know how much you've been involved with digital twins, but like um, with fabrication going on and with multiple people being involved from all across the world, what is the possibilities of using photogrammetry on a developing um, part or a uh, during manufacture. So if you had a setup where you had multiple cameras that were taking uh, photos and collecting data as it was being built on a maybe on a twice a day or daily where it was uploaded at one point, could you then have, would it, I guess it's just making multiple models of the same thing, but you'd be able to track the the progress of a model every time but is that something that's ever used where it's used to track the development of yep. um of a uh, fabrications as they're going along to make sure they're not going out of spec or is that like a normal is that a a, a different area or i mean what you're talking about is something the aerospace industry and the automotive industry do every day um, if you think of alignment and the dimensional control of fitting a wing to an aircraft or yep. fitting a a, 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 um, a, a something inside a car so it fits perfectly most of those use photogrammetry to well check the jigs at least mm. to make sure that the jigs are in the right place and stuff because it's like a process when you're making a car is a process called body in white where they have the jigs and then they are all precision aligned so everything fits in so when they well they all the dashboard actually fits in without squeaking it sounds a bit banal, but basically it used photogrammetry is one of the key tools that are used for that. Right. However, it is a common tool that is used throughout lots of manufacturing. Um, in the nuclear industry in particular, where you refabrication pieces off site because you can't do it in site, um, then it's critical to be able to measure in the fabrication yard to make sure it's going to fit in situ because they haven't got any rework facilities inside. Yeah clear plan. Um, so photogrammetry is one of the ways that you can do that, but maybe give you an example of where we're working. So we've got a project we're working with HS2 at the moment. And there's a big bridge outside of Euston station where the new HS2 station is going to be and the tunnels going out. And this is a 150 year old bridge. So what we've done is we've photographed that. Now people from all over the world can actually go and have a look at it drive and deal in, go and have a look at the detail, because this isn't just about structural engineering, it's about what they've got to do to fabricate to strengthen the bridge. Um, so they've got a number of things. One, they've got to produce a 3D model, because they didn't have it, just had Victorian drawings. Um, then they've got to figure out what extra facilities and fabrications they've got to put in to strengthen it. Then they've got to check on site off-site in the fabrication yard before they bring it to the, the railway line. This is right outside Euston station. Mm -hmm. They've only got a very short window to lower all this stuff in and align it, you know, like one shift. Yeah. And they can't drop it down because if they dropped it, then that's Euston station wiped out. Yeah. So in terms of making sure dimensionally it's right, it's fine. But just one of the things that's happened on this job is on one day because we this is this Google Street View um, can be viewed by lots of people on one day last month 180 people from all around the world were able to view this model and make decisions based on it. So we had people in the Chicago office of the big consulting engineer in Bangalore in the engineering group who were actually doing the 3D model. We had HS2 and their JV partners all looking at it. We had people from the cultural world looking about uh, making sure it was preserved for archaeological heritage and stuff. So we were able to share all that information with just sharing an email link. So in terms of collaboration, it means that normally the collaboration tools are in the design stage and you have to have a CAM model. The problem is there's an much bigger audience outside. Yeah. So there's people to do with health and safety and risk assessment. There's procurement. So 
one of the big things they've done in this is they've put this model into the tender documentation and then said, right, guys, this is what you've got to do to paint it, for example, or sandblast it to prepare it, you know, to, to preserve it. So they put a link into their model to their um, to their procurement and now people can go and walk around it. They wouldn't be able to because the only access they've got to this is if they have safety personnel escorting them at okay. night within a very small window because it's a live train line. Yeah. But the same thing applies whether it's an offshore platform or whether it's a shipyard or it means that people. So say, for example, you might do a fabrication and then you can actually show your client what's going on and then they can feed back and say, actually, I don't like it. Could you paint a different shade of green? <laughs> or they might say, actually, okay, uh, you, we want to make sure that the bit that we're fitting onto this is going to fit. So can you give us some dimensions? It's a collaborative portal, if you like. So yeah. you can share amongst everybody. Plus, you can get dimensionally accurate measurement from it and look at the condition. What you're talking about as well is something that lots of shipyards, especially in the Pacific, uh, Pacific Rim in Korea, Korea um, Japan do which they're using photogrammetry to look at the assembly and it's almost like a time lapse. You build mm. up over a period of time to see what's happening. Yeah, it's great in relationship to the client. I mean, it's, it's a choice sometimes whether you want the client to see how far you are behind or ahead. <laughs> the commercial thing sometimes, sometimes you, you've got too much information you want to share. Yeah. But at the same time, if you are then transporting something and assembling it something else, it means you guys can actually see what's going on. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's it's a collaborative tool, but the simple answer is yes. You can use it for all sorts of things. Yeah. Okay. So, so is that, off, uh, it's my, my, no, it's good. An enthusiast. Yeah, this. no, of course. <laughs> so, is there anything that you see a, a great um, use for photogrammetry being used for in? the near future that is maybe not being used for you've said it's been used in quite a lot of industries we might not know about it being used right now but is there are any areas that you see a great potential for it that with new developments coming along that could aid with it being utilized a lot further well it's interesting you say that as well because um, this week i'm having a conversation with a swedish company and they use drones um, and what they can do is they, they fly two drones up say in your fabrication yard or your fabrication shed, and um, they can then produce a live 3D model on the fly. So while, while the drones are flying? Yeah, so the drones fly and they're using stereoscopic imagery to actually produce a live 3D model. Wow. Now, we're in partnership with these um, because they, one of the things is that's great, but if you've got shadows and things, Mm. Then you've got to eliminate that, and that's why they're talking to us because they want to right. elim- well, help. We they want us to help them eliminate the shadows. But I would love to get that system because I can fly two little mini drones mm-hmm. up, and then we can produce a 3D model live that you can look at, and then you can fly around to another bit, and it'll produce a 3D model of that bit live. Now, this is going to be launched. They've already proven they can do it, um, and it's going to be probably a commercial product probably this time next year, to be fair. But that's where the market's going. Live 3D modeling. But also the other big market is in virtual reality or augmented reality because we can convert our 3D models so you can look at them in immersive goggles. Now, to be fair, it's probably a bit of a gimmick right now. Um, largely because you still get seasick and motion sickness using virtual goggles. Mm-hmm. However, the technology is becoming better and better. So there'll be a point where you will be able to walk around, your client will be able to walk around your fabrication and see it live. Um, you will be able to see how things are being assembled. Um, if you are you know, moving things, so let's say, for example, you make a jig and it's, it works perfectly well and it's perfectly flat on your floor when you get it to the client it's all twisted and things like that you will be able to look at remotely and 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 analyze and help the clients or mm-hmm. support people yeah a lot of this technology is already being used and people like boeing are using vr for engine maintenance mm-hmm. but you know i mean a lot of the stuff for hydraulics and all the other things that might be on your fabrications 
um, actually controlling those and being able to do That's maintenance big. on them. Yeah. You could do it remotely. So you could have your maintenance team, you know, yeah. Malin uh, remotely, and then the guy with the spanner going left a bit, right a bit, Jim, yeah. and control it remotely. So no. yeah, you could have project management from the other side of the world if you have a live 3D model that's been projected and then someone can essentially be there to... Yeah, and the other help. thing is what's called augmented reality. So augmented reality will look at an object and then will superimpose things onto it. So the big technology where it's coming in is you're going to be walking down the road and then adverts about the shop will pop into your head or you'll click on a statue and it will tell you the history of it. Mm -hmm that's where we are we're already there it's just those things are going but a lot of the applications are being pioneered in the in the in the consumer market but the big applications where it saves you time effort money makes you look sexy um the sort of technology malin and any uk company you going to be having to go head to head i'll be with people who are competing and have these facilities and have these functionalities and um, it's not just you know make great things and you can you know it's about the service and delivering that extra facility that's you know in the terms of when you've got massively competing you know you're looking at fabrication costs say in the UK compared to what they are in South Southern Asia or the Far East or in Eastern Europe you've got a lot of competition having things that will enhance the value that you give and the life cycle of living with that asset that they've commissioned that's something i feel is, is a major benefit so that's one of the things i suppose the um, the more the most important thing i think is that over the last few years is we've seen the ability for portable devices like your ipad or your iphone to collect these images you do not necessarily need fifty five thousand pounds of laser scanner yeah Sometimes it's not the relevant, it's the right tool. Yeah. But if I'm looking at simple things and I want to relay a 3D model so I can see what it is, you still, sanity says, look, if you're going out to measure something that's critical, do not use a laser scanner to do it. I can tell you there's not one person I know who relies on a laser scanner for re-engineering in the offshore industry, because it's not as good as everyone says. It's great. It gives you a fantastic view, but you know, if I'm trying to get a mating spool in piece and I've only got tolerances of a couple of thou, no, mm -hmm. you've still yeah. got to physically get out there with your calipers or with photogrammetry to actually measure it. Yeah, does that make sense? Really interesting. No, that makes perfect sense. That's great. So, my my last point I had was if you wanted to kind of give a brief little pitch for uh, for what, what what you do what you offer just for as a, a thank you for talking to us today i'm I, i'm also gonna ask as well i'll when we come back to edit this i'll chop in some footage of maybe some of your um your existing projects and show everyone watching okay some of the zooming around and stuff but we can edit that in later and things but like if you wanted to give like a kind of little to be honest, kind of what you what you guys do and um I, I know you've kind of went into it a bit but um the one you maybe the the one that you'd touched on with me before was in the nook uh, the power industry where it was um one of the great things was a uh, capture and knowledge i don't yeah. know if you could re recur that that story again too because that was very okay well um there are a number of the the our difficulty is we can apply this technology in lots of lots of industries and that from a marketing strategic planning point of view makes it quite difficult. I mean, I came from using this in the nuclear industry and it all started with a problem the nuclear industry have and I think most heavy industries have is that of capturing the tacit knowledge, the stuff that can't be documented from all these things. Now, the nuclear industry, the average age of people in the nuclear industry is 56. So over the next few years, they're going to have a massive expertise drain out to the golf clubs and the caravan parks of Britain. <laughs> and uh, I did a job two years ago for Haitian power station EDF, and the program was called Carl's Brain. Well, Carl was a engineer who'd worked there for 30 years. He knew literally where the bodies were buried, I think. <laughs> so every outage, every problem that they had, Carl had sorted it out. And so when Carl was retiring, they said to him, Carl, tell us what you know, when he went, where do you want to start? So what we did was we produced a Google Street View of the nuclear power plant. And then 
uh, Carl could then walk around it and add his own notes to it, his stories, any films, any drawings, anything that he had. Now, this cost them quite a lot of money to do. It's about £100,000 all in all for us to document it and stuff like that. But it saved them, they say, 10 times that on the first outage. Because he was able then, the new engineers were able to pick Carl's brain for what they knew and then know that um, we well, don't put the scaffold in there, you put it there and you do this and you do that. And it's basically documenting the good things, but what we're not very good in the UK at, documenting our cock ups. Yeah. Those are the most important things. So the next generation of engineer doesn't do the same thing and waste in the nuclear industry thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. So what we do is provide an environment for collaboration that any engineering project could use. And we advise people on doing that and then we let people share it. So Rich Picks is our product and platform for doing that. But we also advise people on um, measuring big things. Yeah. And how does that fit into the workflow? Um, simple things like, you know, how if you send if you build a fabrication here in Glasgow and then you ship it somewhere else, how can you make sure that it's being set up in exactly the same position? So that's the sort of thing with photogrammetry, dimensional control we can help with. I think we're focusing largely on this collaboration, this what we call Google Street View on steroids idea. Rich Picks is a platform for you can visit a ship from anywhere in the world if you're a superintendent or a ship's engineer and you can go and visit the engine room and see exactly what's scaffolding, how much space you're going to have. Share that information, not just with your staff, but with the wider stakeholders who may be procurement or health and safety people. Um, so that's made our major thing is um, uh, I'd say is is Rich Picks as a knowledge platform site vessel fabrication documentation, whether that's uh, organizing a, a, an operational manual for it. So <laughs> yeah. click on here and here's the instructions for the calibration certificate for it or the world. Here's what you do. So or maybe it's just part of the fabrication process. So we're really excited because we've got some, we started really August last year. Um, we've got companies like HS2, Network Red, Wales. We've got obviously bits in the marine sector. It's just going nuts and we seem to be catching away. So my, my advice is if you need us, get in quick. Yeah. <laughs> Book us up. Well, I mean, we've just, we've, we no, I, I and it goes, we're just doing, we're just doing a pilot study for the documentation of the Houses of Parliament project. All right. Wow. And we've started this week. Um, yesterday I was on uh, an, uh, an amazing piece of kit at uh, Daresbury, this massive, the world's largest uh, static genera generator thing built in the 1950s, documenting that. We've got some, we've got some great stuff going on. Amazing. That's really good. I'll, I'll, we'll put a link as well to this uh, to your website so you can people can go on and have a look as well. But uh, like I said, we'll cut in some of the videos and some of the, some of the stuff you'd shared with me before because it is really interesting. So, but uh, yeah, no, thank you for your time today. It's been really interesting. You've covered even more than we did last time, so that was really good. Really okay. appreciate it. No worries. Now, if anybody's got wants to pick my brain. Well, what's left of it is um, <laughs> feel, feel free to get I'm sure you can get in touch and find yeah. us anyway so um but yeah anything we can do to help let us know yeah that's yeah, great there's some so some of the stuff we do yeah that's great All right cheers for that Barry I'll I'll end the call and then when we um when we get this all edited and stuff like that I'll share a copy back we'll share a copy with you and make sure you're happy with it before we share it to the wider world or whatever we do yeah, but I think so, yeah I've, I've covered all the techie stuff I wanted to cover so perfect that's great thanks so much for that and I'm sure we'll be in touch with you again at some point uh, with with stuff so Jim Jim's off this week so we're yeah yeah, yeah. well once you get us back have a chat because you were talking about this stuff around about the uh, rotunda and doing yeah stuff. that yeah that would be really good so that would be dead interesting and I I'd love to be able to come out on a, a job to see stuff being done so that'd be really good okay all right all right, right. thanks for having anyway, cheers i'll speak cheers. to you soon bye, cheers. bye. bye.